Strangely enough, I actually began shooting and editing this video before the recent events and the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist at this point to realize the deep divisions and fragmentation, isolation, depression, anger that's happening in society, the meaninglessness, the rage, the skepticism about institutions, even about science at this point for many reasons. Um, we're becoming increasingly isolated and divided. I think this is a recent manifestation of a long-standing problem that's worsening. Um, and I don't make this video to emotionally manipulate anyone whatsoever. But I had to reshoot the ending of this video, and I wanted to just make these points, bring it together, and just leave you with a thought. The video won't be for everybody, and this probably won't get a lot of views, but these are some things that have been on my heart and mind lately, and it's going to seem like I'm rambling a bit, but I'm really going to bring this all together in the end. I've been thinking about my favorite of the recent philosophers. He's a man named Sir Roger Scruton, and he's of course passed on now. Let me tell you a little bit about him and then tell you why I relate to the man so deeply. And I think that Sir Roger Scruton really is sort of emblematic of where so many of my friends and our neighbors are. Sir Roger Scruton was sort of an oddball in the philosophical realm. He was, I think in the 1960s, but sometime in his youth, sitting in a big city in Europe. I think it was Paris. And I can imagine him just sitting at a cafe having his, you know, his tea. And he observes the riots that take place from these young college kids, these revolutionaries who are really influenced by Marxist ideals. The thing that most struck me about those students in the street was the um, sentiment, sentimentality of their anger. It, it, it was all about themselves. It wasn't about anything objective. Uh, here they were, the spoiled middle-class children, baby boomers, who'd never had any real difficulty to cope with, uh, shouting their heads off in the street, uh, burning the cars belonging to ordinary proletarians, whom they pretended to be defending against some imaginary oppressive structures erected by the bourgeoisie. The whole thing was a, a complete uh, fiction based on the antiquated ideas of Karl Marx, ideas which were already redundant in the mid-19th century. That they were enacting out, if you like, a, a self-scripted drama in which the, the central character was themselves. And Sir Roger says, whatever they are, I'm not that. And this experience he had of watching, you know, mobs of young people trashing a city and the beautiful art and architecture that took centuries to build and generations of treasure poured into it and they're tearing it down in the name of progress or freedom or rights or whatever. And Sir Roger basically just saw that as a tragedy and it marked his intellectual career. He went on to write books criticizing some of the postmodern philosophers that have been so deeply influenced by Marx like Jean-Paul Sartre and Foucault. And these people really have Marxist ideals, not just as an economic system, but as sort of a way of viewing society and history. And this is what Roger Scruton rejected so firmly. So Sir Roger Scruton began looking to older ways of thinking. And he, of course, read Plato and Aristotle and the Western tradition of thought that developed the Western civilization that we, we live in today. But I'm confident that Sir Roger Scruton was never able to fully bring himself to believe in traditional religion. And he did a very famous BBC special on beauty. He was basically pointing out the difference between modern art and traditional art. And I think he really did have profound insights into aesthetics. In fact, the current King of England and him had, I think, shared views on the architecture uh, Sir Roger seemed to lament the fact that the traditional London cityscape had been sort of uglified in the modern world. What used to be a, a central point of focus, maybe St. Paul's Cathedral, was is now been sort of covered up, and that natural eye line of beauty has been sort of broken up by these modern, ill-planned, uh, ugly 
modernist buildings. He points out that modern art was no longer focused on the beautiful, but it was really focused on the shocking, uh, to, to grab your attention, to compete for the attention in this very busy consumerist world. And to him, he thought that the very wealthy people who bought this art and would pay a very high dollar for it, really bought it because they're just trying to show that they understand this art. The more they pay for it, the more that they can say that they understand it, when really it means nothing. I think this has affected our music, our architecture. And Sir Roger Scruton was just very much against this. So what he did instead was he wanted to bring us back to revisit the transcendent, to get us, pull us away from the hard things of daily life, as you know, I think the Christian period did, and to help us envision the transcendent realm. I think human beings are incomplete without a concept of the sacred. They, they must have a sense that, that this world in which they live has moments, places, uh, events, people, etc., which are in some sense standing outside the ordinary uh, course of events. They're not just things to be bargained with, things to be bought and sold, but as it were, stand in judgment on us. Uh, and all of us have that sense when we're children, um, because that is instinctive in us, but it's wiped away by materialism and by the ease of get, uh, the, the ease of satisfying our wants and so on. Uh, and the result is we're, that we are, in a certain measure, bereft, bereft of something that is needed for our happiness, which is the sense that we are in good, relations with sacred things. Today in our society, people are growing more and more depressed, feeling more and more isolated. There's more and more division and fragmentation. I think that the roots of these things go back centuries, um, and it's a very complicated thing. It's not one factor, it's many factors sort of spiraling down. And I think that many thinkers throughout history whether it's Friedrich Nietzsche or C.S. Lewis or Chesterton or Roger Scruton in their own way, saw the problems and that society was on the verge of something bad. Some of these things are as simple as people might be overworked to the point of exhaustion, breakdown of communities, uh, cultural identity, family in the home, difficult to maintain and make friendships in the modern world. And I think also this loss of beauty is also a factor. You can think about times in which buildings and cities, even if they had other problems, there's no utopia, but they might have had, um, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, you might have had the loss of workers' rights and some poverty. But at the same time, in these places with traditional architecture and beauty, in which they put great effort, not just for profit, but for beauty for beauty's sake, uh, people living in these things did feel more at home and had a more of a sense of meaning. In the modern world, very often people don't believe there's meaning at all. This is something Roger Scruton, I think, was just trying to remind us of. But he was really massively influenced by a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. And Kant literally lived in a time in which, um, I'm going to be quite blunt in this video and share my own views. My intent is not to offend anyone. This is just, this is what I think. Um, since making the decision to join the historic Catholic Church, um, if you're an atheist or a, a Baptist brother and sister evangelical, I'll still consider you my friend. And if you're a baptized believer, I'll still consider you a brother or sister in Christ. But it was interesting to me that when I made this decision, um, everyone of my friend groups, I think, tried to make sense of this in their own way. Um, I got a lot, my wife and I got a lot of the much learning hath made thee mad. And I can understand why you might think that, but um, I'm not trying to sound smart. I'm just trying to make sense of the world as it is. And I made a decision. Some Baptists have, a couple of my acquaintances, have almost been accusatory and said you basically stopped reading scripture and you just thought that the churches were these pretty buildings in the Catholic Church and that's why you joined. Now, I can't understand why one would think that I would sabotage all my life plans because I thought a building was pretty. It doesn't make any sense. And scripture certainly played a major role 
and me coming to the Catholic Church. And I've talked about that and will continue to talk about the fact that I think well-meaning Protestants, even after the Reformation, uh, sort of forgot some of the major themes in Scripture. I think this is changing. But I've had some of my atheist friends, and they, they can't really quite make sense of why I became a Catholic either. And oftentimes they think I'm trying to intellectualize an ignorant thing that they would think is faith. Um, none of this is the case. Something has gone drastically wrong in the world. For all the many right things and modern conveniences, I think it's just clear to me that we took a wrong turn at Albuquerque, as Bugs Bunny would say. Immanuel Kant lived in a time in which skepticism had really taken root in the minds of academics in the West. And I've talked about this before. I, can, I won't talk about it in too much detail, but I'm quite convinced of this. Um, the Enlightenment was really just a hop, skip, and a jump from the Reformation. I don't think of the Reformation in terms of all Catholics are the good guys and all Protestants are the bad guys. I don't think history usually works like that, though sometimes it does. Um, and I'm clearly no fan of Martin Luther. But um, I think there's these decisions that were made that were political, cultural, and, and religious set us on a path and I think there's scholarly support for this now. Um, the Stripping of the Altars is a book worth reading. Um, the Unintended Reformation, basically how these reformers set us on this path to um, extreme secularism. This is, I think, the hollowing out of society. Kant was really responding to earlier philosophers, uh, John Locke and David Hume, uh, Leibniz and others, and for some of these people, they were very skeptical about knowledge at all. How can we know that an external world outside of our mind exists? Um, how can we know that we exist at all? How can we know that we can have uh, confidence in our knowledge about what we observe or reason? And Kant, I think, was a very brilliant man, and I think it's unfortunate that he had to do what he did. Some of the philosophers were taking an extreme skepticism and they wound up in a rationalist mindset. Now we can sort of, to be blunt, I think these people sort of got stuck in their heads and couldn't find their way out. They, they, this is a historic loss of confidence in Western civilization, the history of ideas that have developed our civilization. And this goes extremely deep. My atheist acquaintances very often, very often, almost always uh, fail to see just how deep the Western psyche, our views of art, rights, architecture, law, um, women, have been shaped by this Christian tradition. And when we begin to strip these things away and toss this out, well, I think Nietzsche was frankly right to say that the death of God in society, or the, the killing of God. Of course, he didn't believe in God. He didn't think that we literally stabbed God. But metaphorically, um, the, the, the liberal theologians who tried to incorporate these Enlightenment ideals, um, they had stabbed God and were still holding the bloody knife. And they hadn't realized the consequences of what they had done. But Nietzsche, I think, knew very well that hell on earth was coming. And since his day, um, waves of hell have washed over this globe. I'm not, unfortunately, sure that it's finished. Kant was responding and engaging with these two forms of thinking about how we can know things. And how we know things, this even affects how do we know what's right and wrong? What should our society look like? What should morality, what should our laws reflect? And Kant is trying to reconcile, I think, the belief in a an objective world that really exists about which people have become skeptical and that we could that we were these selves that could observe this realm this is something that greatly appealed to sir roger scruton and kant believed in a transcendent realm but he was i think rejected some of the historic arguments for god's existence and in this loss of confidence in scholasticism and frankly just Catholicism in our historic religion, the religion of our fathers. It's not just the religion of our fathers, it's as Chesterton said, the religion that built the lands of our fathers. This historic loss of confidence in all this, 
Kant is sort of trying to reinvent almost from scratch a system of everything. He's trying to show what is right and wrong, um, his categorical imperative. He's trying to have a system for how we can demonstrate that we know things. And yet he also sees that the world is more than just material, as modern atheists would say, it's not just matter. Uh, for example, um, we get upset and offended when we see injustice in the world. And yet, um, this justice doesn't seem to be something that's fully embodied in any court. And if every court in the world, uh, run by human beings, well, they have imperfections, and they're not just 100% of the time. And yet, when we see the injustice in these human courts, we simply know that something is not quite just or right here. And we long for this thing, justice, the thing that Socrates asked about so much. And I think this is a really good indicator that justice is this transcendent, immaterial thing that exists apart from the courts of humans. Um, so Kant would try to remind us of these transcendental things. This appealed to Sir Roger Scruton. And I think he was trying to, I think sadly he was watching his own culture, country, society, um, and steep and steady decline in influence of power around the world, but also in art and cultural influence. And I mean, people are far more depressed now than they used to be. Loss of identity. And he's trying to point out that the consumerist matrix that we've all been, that we've all grown up with at this point, um, can't really give you meaning. And so he tried to remind us of historic art as opposed to modern art, to the great music of the past as opposed to just, you know, pop music all the time. Uh, pop music is sort of like, it can be fun, but it can be just empty calories, whereas something like Strauss can be more nourishing. And yet even here, towards the end of his life, uh, Sir Roger Scruton, I think, recognized that just trying to point people towards the historic tradition of art. Ultimately, that is not going to solve all of society's ills either. And so Sir Roger Scruton um, became an Anglican, and he wrote a book called Our Church, and he's talking about um, the contributions of the Anglican Church and the nice things about it, and he just tries to consider himself, I think, an Englishman. But I don't think he could ever fully bring himself to believe in God, in the historic Christian religion. He was influenced by, he loved Wagner, and knowing full well that Wagner probably wasn't a good person. Wagner was influenced by a man named Fürbach. Fürbach was an extremely influential atheist uh, in the Enlightenment period, and most modern internet atheist arguments you hear can be linked back to Fürbach, though I think most internet atheists have no idea where this came from the idea of a sky daddy. But Fürbach basically thought that, um, and Freud, I think, had similar leanings, that the gods are basically just projections of internal longings. These are things that we, we wish for, that we long for, and we sort of project our angst or our longings, our wish fulfillment, if you will, onto the heavens. And so Wagner wrote, of course, the famous Ring Cycle, with uh, you know, the Flight of the Valkyries, very famous music. So if you grew up watching Bugs Bunny, you've definitely heard some of Wagner's music. But Wagner knew full well, being good friends with Nietzsche, that Christianity was on the decline in the West. We killed God. And he was, I think, trying to revisit pre-Christian heroic paganism to reinvigorate the spirit of Germany. Now, shortly after Wagner's life, of course, other people... Uh, also believed in revisiting the heroic paganism, the heroic spirit of pre-Christian Germany. They also were fans of Wagner. Those are important things to keep in mind, though I don't think Wagner is fully to blame for this. And yet, in the play, he has, you know, the Germanic versions of Odin and Thor and Loki, he has Wotan, Brunhilde, Brunhilde and Siegfried. But these are psychological projections. Wagner himself did not believe in the gods. And, but he sort of knew that people needed this sort of meaning. I think this is where Sir Roger Scruton was with Christianity. I just don't think he could fully accept that 
um, this God, this grounding of reality itself, this um, reality for which we scarcely have words that's beyond our reasoning, that exists independent of the universe, that the universe depends on. I don't think that he could fully accept this. And actually, I just recently messaged a, an acquaintance of mine who knew him personally. And he said, yeah, he, had, he struggled with belief in things like angels and the resurrection. And I can understand this. I think this is where so many of our friends and family and neighbors are. While we thought in the modern world that we were merely stripping away excesses of metaphysical speculation and grounding ourselves in the concrete, the material, the observable, I think unfortunately for the last few centuries, more and more, the intellectual leanings into skepticism, this loss of confidence in our past, in philosophy and theology and scripture and authority. Um, and we'll talk about the fact that this really does have a mass influence in the world, whether you accept it or not. That has really been more than just a reduction of the world to the observable. It's been a stripping away of the transcendent that Kant tried so hard to enshrine and protect. And this has been to our loss. The belief in the sublime, the beautiful, morality, justice. Uh, we, we've subjectified these things, and we've also thought that perhaps they don't really exist in a concrete way. Whereas thinkers like Plato or Philo or the Neoplatonist or the Christians would, of course, believe in these things. And this is something that Sir Roger Scruton uh, really wanted to help us revisit. And yet I think it's the way that these things have been grounded ontologically in the nature of their being, historically, in theology and philosophy, that I think he just sort of struggled with. So I think he was on a journey, and he knew that the, the modern world had, was, were being dehumanized. Um, and he sought the answer to these things, and I just genuinely admire the man for this, and he came so far. And I think taking steps throughout his life towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. And I think because of the world in which he lived, for whatever reason, um, people struggled to fully believe in these things. And so what he did was he acted. He, even though he intellectually or emotionally might have struggled for whatever reason, when he saw enough to see that something like this was true and the answer, he acted on that belief. They, I think at first, so many of the internet atheists, like the amazing atheists on YouTube, just spew this simplistic, you know, vitriol against religion. And I think they don't, they don't know what they're speaking of. Other people, I think, have come to long for the religion of the past, but they just can't quite get themselves to believe it. Now, if that is you, I just, I just want to say this for what it's worth. I can genuinely relate to you. I think the way I would say it is, I don't think it's as though people are becoming atheists in mass because they're all reading science and physics and Nietzsche, and they're all deciding that the evidence proves that God does not exist. I really don't think that's it. Instead, I think what's happening is complex, and it's a downward spiral. One time I had a professor say that society isn't becoming secular because of the atheists, People are becoming atheists because society has secularized. People exist in the culture in which they exist. Um, modern Western culture has been increasingly secularized for many reasons. Uh, consumerism has been a major problem of that. Um, meeting bad religious people or religious people saying incredibly ignorant things. I can relate and understand all this. Um, this loss of confidence. And so people often feel that there is no meaning, though they want for there to be meaning. I know people like this. Um, there was a song by Fall Out Boy in which they just say, hey, there is no meaning, nothing means anything, it's all empty and hollow, so what do I do? I, will, I, I go get a Big Mac. Um, that's where a lot of people are. They just consume Netflix and Hulu and Spotify and buy things and try to seek pleasure and live their lives you know, wishing there was meaning, but not thinking that there is. I think this all goes back 
to the skepticism that has developed over the centuries and this loss of confidence in the historic Western tradition and even deeper than that, loss of confidence in religion at all. Christianity is really far bigger than the Western tradition. Christianity has had massive influences in Africa, the Middle East, even into Asia. Now, I think we're sort of living on this tip of the iceberg and we don't see the iceberg beneath. Tom Holland is a historian, not the actor. He said, you know, even atheists, we don't quite understand the depth of what it is we're rejecting because the Western psyche has been so shaped and influenced the belief in human dignity, moral worth, rights, uh, even English common law that influenced this country, the Declaration of Independence itself, natural rights, all these, if you, you can take them back to the Enlightenment, but the presuppositions going into the Enlightenment go back much further. And we began to cast those off very shortly after the Reformation. So people living now, as Tom Holland say, swim in Christian waters. I mean, we breathe Christian air even if we're not believers. And I think Sir Roger Scruton was just very much aware of this, and I respect the man greatly. But I've, I've thought about this quite a bit for years. I've been revisiting Immanuel Kant lately in his sort of attempting to reconstruct the system for society to have a system of morality and epistemology and ethics at the loss of the historic one. And I sometimes think about the skeptics like David Hume, and I think, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers thought if we just utilize human reason and we have more freedom and more science and more material wealth and capitalism, that eventually we're going to sort of create this utopia human society of reason and progress. I'm convinced that centuries of history have proven that assumption to be false. Um, I'm, I'm a very American person, and so I was very infatuated with Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, all these guys for some time, and I, I still have respect for them in some regards, but I see now that they really were missing large portions of the picture that we'd rejected. And I remember texting my mother years ago, and I was studying all this, and I said, you know, I think, I think the Founding Fathers weren't thorough enough. There's something missing here in their, their philosophy. And the more I put it together, the more I think I started to realize what they're missing. And today, we're divided and fragmented in society over everything. Everything. And I think this is because people have very little to hold society together as a common glue. Think about what we have in America or the European nations that hold us together. Well, you could say, well, common language. And I think perhaps there's something deeper than, than common language. We could say geographical necessity. And I think historically, before travel was so available, sure, geographical you know, chance or necessity was what formed some part of the cultural identity. But really, these things go much, much deeper than that. You can read the medieval historians, you can read uh, Bede, you can read Eusebius, you can read uh, even pagans, pagan writings, and you see that it's more than these things that give people a common identity. And at the loss of this, I think this is what Wagner was trying to step in, and knowing full well that something had to replace this. This is what I think full well um, with better intentions, George Lucas <laughs> tried to step in and do with, with Star Wars, um, a modern myth. This is full well, I think, what Sir Roger Scruton was trying to do by helping us revisit the, the great art and music of our past. I think that, um, believe it or not, mainline uh, conservative, theologically conservative Protestants and the Catholic Church, that we really have far more in common than I would have thought as a Baptist. Now, we're going to have some strong, vehement, doctrinal disagreements, but we have far more in common than I would have thought. But even amongst that, I do see where in this uncertainty about how we know things, we sort of had the idea, as when I was a Baptist, that if I just have these texts, the Bible, well, everything I, I believe can come from this text. And of course, the text itself never says this. 
And then people who disagreed with what we believed, well, it's because they just didn't read the text. Or if they did read it, they didn't read it well enough or they read it antagonistically. Well, then you get to know, you know, theologically conservative, uh, charitable Presbyterians. And of course that's not the case. Um, but we're going to differ sometimes passionately about what these texts say. And we do have some things, this mere Christianity that C.S. Lewis uh, taught us about, these core doctrines that hold us together. But I, I really think that um, it was the full Christianity, not, not the bare bones basics, it was the full Christianity that developed the West, that gave us these common identities before this enlightenment nationalism, the skepticism, the fragmenting. And that's what I found in the Catholic Church, the historic church. Well, you think, if, if you're an atheist, you might think, well, we just need reason. You know, we don't need these fairies. I, I, I re recently watched a video by a, a young man. He's, um, because I think he refers to religion as fairy tales. That's a very simplistic way of looking at religion. Um, if you're an angry young man who doesn't, who hasn't studied much culture, history, philosophy, and you're just angry at the religious people. Um, atheism is often not just a head problem, it's a heart problem as well. Um, many of my atheist friends have been very hurt, uh, abused, abusive fathers, neglectful fathers, um, skepticism about religious people, but also oftentimes there's just the desire to not want to live to be held to religious sexual ethics and to be able to give to charity but kind of sleep with who you want to. I'm not judging you, but that is that is a factor for many people. Well, if we just cast off these fairy tales and we just reason our way to the future, one, our human reason, I think, is even worse than the Baptist who would like to proof text the Bible. Um, the disagreements become even deeper. The cracks run deeper. Because it turns out that human reason, when we start from different starting places with different presuppositions or even desires, will wind up in very different places. And oftentimes the people preaching reason in history, as in the French Revolution, became extremely violent. Now, of course, this isn't all atheists that would do this. I'm just trying to show that when I'm thinking of society large term, that I think both of these things miss something key. So what did I do? Well, this is a decision I've had to make in my own life time and time again. I'm not telling you that I'm better than you, that I have all the answers. I'm not trying to intellectualize faith. I'm trying to understand the world as it is, not as I want it to be. Human history is a complicated thing, but it is a reality. The same human history which holds Friedrich Nietzsche and Immanuel Kant and Roger Scruton and Roger Maxson and you, who also held the ancient Greeks and the Africans and the Asian thinkers and Lao Tzu. That is all one history. And here's, here's what challenged me. Um, when I became very skeptical of myself, and maybe there were personal reasons I had for this. Very skeptical of religion. It would have been easy to do what some of the modern atheists say, like Richard Dawkins did, or Chris Hitchens, and say that Jesus of Nazareth doesn't even exist. It's a fairy tale. It's a myth. I, I listen to these men, but the problem is that's simply not true. In the same human history, Jesus of Nazareth existed. There's abundant evidence for this. Even skeptical scholars like Bart Ehrman will tell you Jesus of Nazareth existed. Well, you could say that, yes, maybe there was a Jewish carpenter or peasant or something that lived, and he was just like all the other failed messianic figures, like the Essenes and all these people that these sects believed, hoping that the Roman Empire would go away. Maybe he was just one of those. But then the later Christians, centuries after his death, maybe the Catholic Church just incorporated paganism and copied all these pagan elements 
from pagan religions, the the dying and rising god motif, or elements of Isis and Osiris, or all these other gods, and just copied and pasted them onto this historical figure about whom we can know nothing, and created this religion to control the masses. Maybe Constantine just wanted to unify his people, so he had his academics create this from, make this abominable, you know, amalgamation of paganism and Judaism. That's not true. It's just not true. The influence of Christianity on the world can scarcely be overstated. It's influenced so much, especially in the West, but really globally. The Copernican Revolution really has nothing on the Christological Revolution. Strangely enough, I actually began shooting and editing this video before the recent events and the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist at this point to realize the deep divisions and fragmentation, isolation, depression, anger that's happening in society, the meaninglessness, the rage, the skepticism about institutions, even about science at this point for many reasons. Um, we're becoming increasingly isolated and divided. I think this is a recent manifestation of a long-standing problem that's worsening. Um, and I don't make this video to emotionally manipulate anyone whatsoever. But I had to reshoot the ending of this video, and I wanted to just make these points, bring it together, and just leave you with a thought. I think, no, I'm not your better. Um, this is just my thoughts that I'd like to share with you, and I appreciate you taking time to watch. If you struggle with isolation or depression or confusion or despair, skepticism, I can genuinely relate to you. And what I would like to say is some simple things in your life can help. Simple things like getting outside, moving your body, can just kick off chemicals in your mind, your body, that will help you feel better. You know, cutting out caffeine hours before bed, things like, simple things like this. Making time, it's hard nowadays, but making time for friends and family. Those things are important. And I think people who do that often are very often happier. Now, as to the skepticism and long-standing problems and the increased division, a few thoughts. I think that when I look back across history, from my day to Christ's day, I think there are many reasons to just, undeniable reasons to see that Christianity changed the world and that the historical figure that kicked off this revolution was in fact historical. This is a person that I can't easily reject. Um, once you see this person is historical and the revolution of the Western psyche and not just the Western one that took place that's so deep and that still is embedded in our minds today, um, this is not an easy person to reject. Now you can ignore this and just live in the consumerist matrix, but I suggest that now is not the time for that. If God revealed himself, when I look past Roger Maxson and the current events and the Immanuel Kants and the Nietzsche's and the Enlightenment and the Reformation and the problems in the whatever age, I'm looking back at Christ and seeing the change that has taken place. This is something called revelation. This is not the book of the Bible. This is the idea that God himself, this ontological grounding of being, this reality, undergirding reality for which we scarcely have words, but we call God. Throughout all of our limitations in human logic and ability to know things, what if this being, this reality, this God, revealed himself to us in Christ. And throughout all these different empires rising and falling, the different ages, and I think the, the long spiral downwards, I think that Christ's church that he established so many years ago is really strangely enough to me 
been there in history beside it. There have been bad popes. There have been corrupt bishops. I'm not, those are historical facts. And yet, when I look at this history, I don't see that this church, even on its worst days, even when large portions of the church were, large portions of the Christian world had fallen into error, this church, I think by the revelation and action of God, um, hasn't failed, despite the best efforts of humans inside that church. And that's something that's a little difficult for me to even fully grasp. He, Christ said that the gates of hell would not prevail against this church. So if this revelation of God himself to us and his promise that he would preserve this faith once delivered to the saints... If that is true, then against our skepticism and rejection of the intellectual frameworks of the past and are trying to reconstruct new ones and then reconstructing new ones and then reconstructing new ones and are ever, ever more divided, what I think is true is that the truth has been there alongside it the whole time, mixed with imperfect humans and all sorts of problems in different cultural circumstances. That's a profound thing to me, that the God who is just beyond this reality interacts in it. And this sort of overrides skepticism. And what is undeniable is that this has transformed societies. And I think it's simply the case that if societies have rejected this, the societies built on this, um, there has been some amount of societal collapse. It's a complicated thing. And I think any movement, any intellectual movement, Marxism, Wagner, Nietzsche, you name it, all of these things were not just my denomination against your denomination. This was Christendom, its fragmentation, and then the fragmentation of society that's getting worse and worse. But all of these movements have failed. And so as genuinely and as sincerely, because I, I know how it is to be preached to when you don't want it. I mean, this is a video about atheism and faith and society. So I don't think you'll be surprised to hear this, but, and I'm not your better, but for what it's worth, besides moving your body and eating healthier and being with friends and family and trying to calm political temperature that I'm glad some of our leaders are finally calling for. Finally. My genuine advice to you, man to man, person to person, man to woman, is the same advice that St. Peter gave in the New Testament. Even if you struggle with whatever it is that you're struggling with, repent. Believe the gospel and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. Sometimes our bodies and our minds are connected, and the actions and things that we do in our bodies affect the way that we think and see the world. Hence, moving your body affects the way you think. The actions that you can take will help you recover that belief that we've lost in the West. And it may not save society immediately, but it will help you in your life. Now, I'm still learning how to be a Catholic. This has not been an easy transition for me and my family. But I am quite convinced that this is true. And since doing this, I can even notice, um, not at first, but differences in my own life. I think in some ways I've just had to grow. And I think this can be you as you... Repent, believe the gospel, get yourself in church, make this commitment, and then strive for holiness, as the, the scriptures say. Um, this sort of heroic call that Christ asks of us, not just to repent, believe the gospel, but, but to submit our wills to a reality that's greater than us. This actually takes away and helps with 
the skepticism. It's a submission of the will and the mind. And I have come to realize halfway or more through my life that as much as I study, I can't know everything about everything. No one person can. No one generation can. And so to trust that God has been working in this tradition, this history, from the revelation that Christ gave us in himself, the scriptures, the church, is a deeply helpful thing. It is to admit that there is an authority above me and that I am not the authority above everything else. And so that's my advice to you. But I think the things that Sir Roger Scruton was searching, was searching for, that Immanuel Kant, and his philosophy wasn't quite right. You know, it, it added to the modernism. But even in his attempts to recover something that he knew in his era was being lost, um, we don't have to recover it on our own. I mean, we can recover it together the way that multiple cultures around the world have had. This has been a deeply unifying factor in the Western psyche, in global cultures, in common identity as it's worked itself out through time. In so many ways I, I would struggle to find words for. But in your personal life, if there's something I can suggest to you, this would be it. I think this can only help as the world is walking more and more, I think, to the brink of another wave of the death of God. I think we should remember that God is very much alive and in some way align ourselves to that reality. I've been praying a long time for my country, as I'm sure some of you have. Uh, those prayers have increased over the last few days as I think it's become pretty clear. I hope people see just how bad things could get very quickly. Uh, and it's not necessary. It's just not necessary. So I'll be praying for you. I may not know your name, but I'll, I'll be praying for those of you who view this video and I'm praying for my country. Now there's always hope. And I think that by the grace of God, we might have been spared a tragic incident uh, that would have led to more tragic incidents. And I'm praying that continues to be the case, but no matter what happens, my advice to you remains the same. And I also want to remind you that no matter what happens, someone somewhere loves you your life matters. I don't care what the atheists or the materialists or the moral relativists or the doctrinal relativists say. Your life matters. And if God exists, if Christ is true, then your life is worth more than all the weight of all the gold in this world. And so do our neighbors. I hope we treat ourselves and others with this truth. Hey, whoever you are, wherever you are, thank you so much for watching. It's very much genuinely appreciated. As always, thanks for watching. God bless.